Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our Wohilo Hour this week. We hope that you've enjoyed each of the previous installments of, of Wohilo Hour um, with our friendship topic, our outdoor connection, our songs, and our creativity topics over the last few weeks. We hope you've enjoyed those videos and have tried out a few of those activities. If you haven't um, tried those activities out yet, we encourage you to look back on our previous blog posts and try some of those out. This week, our theme is Camp Legends. So we have two uh, activities relating to legends that we'd like to share with you this week. And then to close this video, we have a special guest who's going to tell us a camp legend. Uh, the first activity we encourage you to try is we've provided a document with a few of our popular camp legends. And so what we'd like for you to do is read through those and tell your favorite camp legend to a friend or to your family. The second activity we'd encourage you to try is to act out your favorite camp legend with your family. Um, be creative, come up with props and costumes and backgrounds and, and act, it out, act it out with your friends and family. To tell us about one of our popular camp legends, we've invited a camp legend of our own to share with us today. So Ann Sheets, who is the president and CEO of Campfire First Texas. So she is gonna share with us today one of our favorite camp legends, and we hope that you enjoy hearing from her. Hello, I'm Ann Sheets, and I'd like to tell you one of the legends of El Tesoro about Christenstead. This is the story of a settlement on the Brazos River, Christenstead, that existed from 1928 till 1938. John B. Christensen, a second generation Danish American, was born in 1876. He grew up in Kansas and graduated at age 19 as first in his class at the University of Missouri Law School. He left a successful career as a lawyer in Missouri and came to Rainbow, Texas, which is near Glen Rose, in 1913. Eventually, he owned and operated a sawmill in East Texas and Sabine County. While there, he married a 16-year-old East Texas girl, Myrtle Doris Caldwell. They settled again in Rainbow in 1922, where he was the editor of the Rainbow Reminder and owned the general store. John and Myrtle, while living in Rainbow sometime between 1922 and 1928, built cabins along the river frontage and operated a summer camp. So they were camp directors. A spring at the edge of the main channel of the Brazos River was dammed to create a swimming pool. This camp became a haven for weary urban residents fleeing the congestion of the big city in the 20s, most likely from Fort Worth and perhaps Dallas. That was a hundred years ago. Christensen had some curious dreams. He thought we needed a system of hard surface roads for the new automobiles. Remember that the Model T had become mass produced starting in 1908, so there weren't a lot of automobiles at that time. Most of the roads were dirt. A rural electricity system was needed to bring electricity to all the small communities. An industrial agricultural community was his dream, and that is where he was successful eventually. He purchased 6,000 acres for $120,000 in the bend of the Brazos River on January 1, 1928. The land there was heavily timbered and fertile. This is where Jacob de Cordova had tried and failed in the 1860s to establish a textile manufacturing center. It's Jacob de Cordova who lent his name to what is now called the de Cordova Bend. Christensen decided to call his community Christensted. In Denmark, the Christensen family were known as the Christensens with a K. Stad in Danish means town, city, or home. So Christensted was the home of the Christians. John Christensen, who by then had changed his last name to the Danish spelling, published a brochure describing his settlement. In it, he said, the basic idea is to help folks of small or moderate means to establish homes and small businesses of their own and to have a self-sufficient community. He advertised across the country, noting the splendid opening for Dairy Mint and others as he ad had this ad in the Kansas City Star. Christensen recruited families to come and settle in Christensted. All it took was the purchase of land for $40 an acre with no down payment. Most settlers had 15 acres. 
Every purchase of land came with a cow in the deal. Families were carefully interviewed and told about the philosophy of the community, often referred to as sell much, buy little, or work if you eat. Christianstead was often referred to as a Texas utopia. So what's a utopia? A perfect society in which everything works and everyone is happy, or at least is supposed to be. Could John Christensen be successful? He balked at the description of Christensted as a utopia. Because at Christensted, families had to make some improvements, like building a cabin, barns, fencing, etc. They could then be assisted with the purchase of more cows, pigs, turkeys, or chickens. This is what a typical rock house looked like at Christensted. Now remember, this was the late 20s, early 30s, and you know it looks a lot like the live oak cabins at El Tesoro. If you remember your El Tesoro history, the camp was started in 1934. So this was a very common way to build cabins. Christensen was often described as a Danish farmer in newspaper articles. According to an interview with his wife Myrtle in the late 1970s, this was quite funny to her. She said he didn't know corn seed from pumpkin seed. You have to remember, Christensen's training was as a lawyer. By 1931, there were 25 families living in Christensted with a total population of 146. Included in the colony were a sawmill, a chair factory, and chairs were sold in Texas and 14 other states. They use wood that is too small for lumber, but too good to burn for charcoal. They also had a charcoal factory, a printing plant, which produced magazines, and a creamery for milk and cheese. All of these businesses were to help Christensted be self-sustaining. They also had a U.S. post office and community store. John Christensen himself was the postmaster. They had a school with a radio, piano, and a fine library. They had a natural arbor for religious services. Three of their residents were ministers, a baseball team, and in 1931, their team went 14 and two, and a cemetery. Now, this is what the Christenstead looked like from 1928 to 1938. You see the Brazos River here in blue, and here was the town site, the school, the post office, the cheese factory down here, now compare that with a modern day map of Pecan Plantation. Here's the river, and there's El Tesoro, just across the Brazos. The town site was in the middle, the school, the post office, cemetery, and the cheese factory. Now there's an airstrip. Christensted gained national attention and was called a curious experiment. Even the New York Times had a story about Christensted, which focused on their new magazine called The Interpreter. Now remember that because it'll come up later. The residents of Christensted, whose main jobs were cattle raising and dairy farming, formed a marketing association to take their goods to market in Fort Worth. They even had their own money to use within Christensted. It was quite a drive to Fort Worth and it took an extra 15 miles because there was no bridge across the Brazos. So Christensen built a low water crossing and he built it where the Brazos meets Fall Creek. Now that's the area El Tesoro campers use for canoeing. And that shortened the trip to Fort Worth considerably. The children of the colony also worked, picking grapes and making juice to sell and gathering flowers, herbs, roots, and bark to sell to pharmaceutical companies. But life at Christensted was not easy. There was no electricity, no piped in water, no natural gas, and no telephone service. Heat came from wood burning stoves. Light came from kerosene lamps. Water came from a spring and the river. By 1933, the population was about 200 people, around 40 families. But the Great Depression was devastating the United States. Banks failed all across the country. Jobs in cities were hard to find. 
the residents of Christensted were not happy with their return to nature and they became disillusioned. They were unable to sell their crops. They faced a local drought, no rain. The chair factory burned and they couldn't rebuild it. There was dissension throughout the colony. Christensen took care of some people out of his own pocket, but his funds were not enough. Many of the settlers left. No government aid was available. He admitted to a friend that the settlement had become populated by criminals, communists, fanatics, and rattle-brain cranks of every description, not the kind of people he had envisioned living in Christensted. After one adversary attacked him with a bottle of acid in a struggle over control of Christensted, he retreated to Rainbow. Christensted, the Texas utopia, had failed. John B. Christensen, a sad, disappointed man, died suddenly in 1937 at the age of 61. The bulk of the land was never paid off and by the next year reverted to the heirs of the earlier owners. Christensted, the dream of John Benjamin Christensen was no more. The dream died with its founder. He had been called brilliant but impractical and a man 40 years ahead of his time. Sure enough, most of Christensen's wild ideas became realities. A statewide paved highway system was completed by the state of Texas long ago. A series of lakes along the Brazos River were built, providing flood control and a constant water supply. Electricity lines crisscross rural Hood, Johnson, and Somerville counties. In the early 1940s, Patsy Sprague Shannon was a camper at El Tesoro, later a CIT and counselor. She and her camp buddies ventured across the Brazos River to have a look around the former Christenstead. They found several buildings intact, including the post office, along with many personal belongings which had been left. Pat picked up the first four editions of The Interpreter, one of the magazines published at Christenstead, and today they are in the possession of her daughter, Hattie Shannon Fanolio, herself a former El Tesoro camper, CIT, and counselor. The site of Christensted is within what is now Pecan Plantation. There's an unmarked cemetery in Pecan Plantation and a street named Christensted, but none of the buildings remain. El Tesoro campers still hear about the fascinating story of a man named Christensen who sought to build a self-sufficient community where families lived off the land, farming and producing goods from lumber, and who were not dependent on government assistance for anything. The legend that I first heard about Christensted, told at Camp El Tesoro, describes a community that was abandoned when pursued by government tax collectors, with food left on the stoves and campfires still burning. Now, those details can't be found in any of the published stories about Kristen's stead. But could it be true? No one really knows. Kristen stead, the legend lives on at Camp El Tesoro. I want to thank Patty Finolio, Pat Shannon's daughter, who interviewed David Cleveland and Mildred Mulder in Acton early in, in uh, 2020. And uh, she shared her notes of that conversation with me, which inspired me doing a little bit more research on Christensted. Mr. Cleveland and Ms. Mulder had each visited with original inhabitants of the community of Christensted. You can find a lot of information about Christensted by just Googling it. Here are some of the things that I found, and it is a fascinating story. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the legend of Christensted.